Ah, P Privet? <laughs> oh, I wish I could speak, it, uh, speak Russian. Uh, welcome to Ruby Russia. Uh, this is the 10th anniversary of Russia, including the uh, history of the Rails Club. Uh, three years ago, I was invited to the Rails Club conference. And uh, actually, first I refused. <laughs> because I'm not a rail programmer. <laughs> and uh, they promised to rename it Ruby Russia. And they did. <laughs> okay, this is a Ruby Russia, Ruby conference. And uh, some claims Ruby is good because we are here. Uh, Ruby is productive, Ruby is flexible, and Ruby is fun. But uh, in some aspects, Ruby is bad. And some people uh, claim that Ruby is dead over and over, every year. Probably Ruby is dead every year. <laughs> or some people say that Ruby is less popular. Uh, we have uh, lower TOB index, which is the pro uh, popularity ranking of the programming language out of the 150 programming languages. But uh, we have 11th out of 150 programming languages. OK, not that bad. And uh, in the, the other popularity ranking in the red mark, red mark index, we have 8th out of 20 programming languages. Yeah, Ruby is good enough. <laughs> uh, Ruby, the big sites use Ruby, uh, for example, the, our GitHub, <laughs> the beloved GitHub. Use, uh, uh, is implemented in Ruby on Rails. Uh, Airbnb is in Ruby, Instacart is in Ruby, Cookpad is in Ruby, and many, many other websites are built in uh, Ruby and Ruby on Rails. And uh, I'm sure many Russian uh, web services are implemented in Ruby. And, uh, and I was surprised we have the more than 700 people, almost 800 people here, and uh, which means the Ruby Russia is one of the biggest Ruby conference in the world. That is quite in impressive. Uh, the Ruby is fast enough for most of the cases. And uh, if you reach the limits in some cases, it, I think it's OK. Uh, and uh, the limits is moving. OK, let me tell you, tell you uh, the Twitter story. Uh, Twitter was in, uh, started in 2007, I guess. And it was built, uh, it was built in the Ruby on Rails application. But uh, the, think about that. Its application architecture is not really suitable for the, the CRUD application. So that, uh, f some years later, Twitter moved to Scala which is the JVM language. And uh, the re reason behind it is the Twitter itself is now very really suitable for crowd application, which is uh, the Red Ruby on Rails designed for. And uh, new application like Twitter requires new framework. So that uh, they implemented the new messaging framework in Scala. But, uh, the, the second biggest thing is that they use Ruby 1.8, which is far, far slower than current Ruby. Actually, uh, the basic architecture of the Ruby 1.8 is implemented by myself, so the, the, that was my fault. <laughs> and uh, they tried to improve the performance of the Ruby 1.8, the code named Kiji, and, uh, and, uh, but uh, they we had Ruby 1.9, which is far faster implementation, but that somehow they didn't choose to uh, cooperate with us. And then, then he, the, actually the Twitter gave up uh, Ruby 1.8 and moved to Scala. And then uh, Ruby 1.9 and the later is far, far faster than Ruby, uh, compared to Ruby 1.8. Uh, we have the new virtual machine, which, you call, which co code name is the YAV. And uh, the limit is moving. So the, the Ruby is getting faster and faster. Actually, you know, 
the limit is, does not move spontaneously, so we are moving the limit. So Ruby 2 performance, uh, Ruby 2 improved the performance. Uh, compared to the Ruby 2.3, Ruby 2.6, the, the latest version, is slightly faster. So that, uh, on average, each year, the performance of Ruby in the Rails bench uh, faster in uh, 5 to 10 percent. No, the yearly rate of the 5 to 10 percent improvement is not that bad. But then, you know, we are moving forward. Uh, let's face it, Ruby is not perfect. Uh, we have some issues. Uh, for example, we some some people face performance issue, and uh, we are somewhat weak in the handling the multi-core architecture, and uh, we have some issues in uh, with the bigger team or bigger projects. And uh, performance-wise, so that you know we have improved a lot, but uh, still we are slower than compared to, say, other languages like C++, Go, Rust, and other programming languages. So that people ten, uh, some people uh, chose to use the, you know, the compiled, static type of compiled programming language like Go. Uh, the multi-core is the another issue. The, I created Ruby in 1993, which is 29? Uh, 26 years ago, <laughs> 26 years ago, and uh, at that time, every computer had only one CPU, so that we didn't have multi-core architecture. So, that, uh, so that, that's one of the reasons we have the, the global interpreter lock, and uh, we are not that strong in the multi, handling multi-core architecture. But a bigger team project. You know, Ruby started as a scripting language and then gradually moved toward the web programming language. So that uh, our primary focus is relatively smaller architecture and uh, smaller applications. But, uh, uh, but uh, some Rails applications are quite big, even millions of lines of Ruby code, including test code. So that in with uh, you know hundreds of people working on the single application, so that that kind of big team issue and a, a big project team issue, as a you know, we sometimes hear about the, the like a, we we have if we could have the static type uh, static typing, the we could find error more easily or something like that. In any way, open source community, the Ruby community, cannot stop because we have no initiation, we have no admission, so that we just hear by attracted by the technology. So that you are free to leave if you want. You are not forced to use Ruby. If you want, you want to uh, you might go to say Python, PHP. TypeScript, whatever technology, but uh, you are here because the Ruby is attractive, Ruby is productive. So that, uh, the point is we have to keep moving forward to attract people like you so that we keep improvement even further in the coming version, the major release of Ruby 3. Uh, Ruby 3 is the future. And uh, how can we improve the future of Ruby language? The, I classify the future into threefold, performance, concurrency, and the static analysis. Uh, let me talk about the static analysis first. This is kind of complicated issue. Uh, static typing is quite popular in this century. The recent language like Go, Rust, Swift, uh, those languages have static typing. And they are quite popular. And uh, as the project grows, so the tests become burden. 
And then test increases size, test execution takes more time. But uh, tests are not dry. So that I, I confess I don't like tests. Uh, it's against dry principle. Don't repeat yourself. So the test, the program, is the way to describe the work we want to be done by the computers. And then test is the another form of what we want, describe what we want. And then we compare those two, and if we have any contradiction between the two, the programs and tests, so that we can find errors. But uh, if we, the computers can find errors by themselves, so we, have to, we don't have to write any tests. But uh, unfortunately, computers are not that smart yet, and uh, we write tests anyway. <laughs> we do write tests anyway. But uh, we, want to be, we want to be more productive. And uh, so the, what other languages try? For example, PHP. Recent PHP has the, the, the feature named type hinting. The Python 3 has type annotation. And the JavaScript is the, the other dialect with the type, type declaration called TypeScript. So what, shall we, what should we do? Ruby community should react to this request. Adding type annotation to the language? Like PHP or Python did? No. <laughs> I hate type annotations because it's not dry. <laughs> uh, we want that type hinting uh, because it's not needed. We have a plan. We have a plan for Ruby 3. We are going to add some kind of the static type checking uh, with uh, the following components. Uh, type definition syntax, type definition of libraries, type profiler, static type checkers, and ID support. Uh, type definition syntax is a new syntax of the type declaration of the of Ruby program. Uh, this is this project is done by Sotaro Matsumoto in, back in Japan, who, who is not my relative. <laughs> Actually, Matsumoto is quite popular family name in, in Japan. Uh, this is kind of compromise. When uh, we write separated files to describe types. The type information include the argument types, return value types, class and module types, and the interface with the generic, uh, somewhat generic type including. Uh, the type signature comes like this. Class foo has method foo that returns void. Uh, and the 2s method that uh, returns strings. The 2s method might uh, take uh, argument integer, which is the base, uh, and then returns string. This is kind of straightforward. And then we are going to have this kind of format. Uh, this is kind of compromise. I I'll explain you later. And then, then we are working on the tool to pass this file. Uh, the, from here, ah, oh, I made a mistake. Uh, Ruby signature project is migrated to the Ruby project, so the github.com ruby slash ruby signature. I made a mistake, sorry. Uh, then we are going to provide a type definition for libraries, the standard bundle libraries. And, uh, and uh, we are going to provide a way for gems to provide their, their type information with them. The third component is type profiler, which is the tool to uh, gather the type information from your product programs. Uh, the use case endo is working on it. The, this, this type profiler is the key component of the static analysis, uh, which use the technique called abstract interpretation, or AI for short. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a stupidly uh, simple Ruby program. Uh, we have we defined the method foo, and then call foo method. So the type profiler 
find the the call of the full method with the argument integer, then the argument A must be integer. Then integer plus two, integer class has the plus method, so that it's okay. But uh, it, if it calls the undefined method in, in the integer class, it will cause error. So type profiler collect type information and uh, detect type conflict of type information. And uh, the also type profiler can generate the type signature from of your program. So the type profiler can act as a level one static type checker, and uh, it also you can use it as a the Ruby signature generator. And then the you know the Ruby type profiler is not panacea, so the uh, you might have some issues of the of generated uh, signatures, but you can refine it. It's it's kind of separated file, so you can refine it to have the better. Uh, check type checking. For example, our type, signi our type profiler cannot generate the generic types or uh, union types or something like that, so that you can refine it. Uh, you may also, we may also provide the YAR to RBS generator so that your YAR document can generate the type signature. Then, uh, with the type information provided by standard libraries and generated by the type profiler, or maybe you can you can you you are refined type signature, we can uh, run the static type checkers. Uh, we have currently the two, actually three, uh, static type checkers. One is the Solbet from a company named Sol, uh, Stripe. The the second is uh, Steep. Steep, I mean uh, Steep. Which, which is implemented by the Sotaro Matsumoto, who is in charge of the Ruby signature. Uh, those tools use obvious type C definitions, and, uh, and uh, those two have the different characteristics. Uh, we, we have the, uh, the other static type checker named RDL, uh, which is the basis, which be was basis of those two type uh, newer type checkers like a Solbe and a Steep. Uh, Solbe, you can find Solbe here, and uh, it's implemented in C++ and it's in incredibly fast. And uh, it works mostly nominal and it supports type annotation DSL instead of the type signature. Uh, they are working on the Ruby signature and uh, they are working on the ID support too. Uh, too. Uh, they few months ago they open sourced the Solve, so that you can try it. Uh, Steep is the different approach of the the static type checkers. So you can find Steep there here, and uh, it's written in Ruby, so it's relatively slower. But uh, it uses the structure typing, it's, which is more uh, flexible type checking, and uh, since it's written in Ruby, you can experiment uh, of uh, static typing in Ruby using Steep. Uh, I think these two, Solve and Steep, is has a, st a healthy competition. In addition, we are working on the IDE support. So the Solve has IDE support for the VS Code. So the, if you use VS Code to write Ruby, so you can uh, use the, the Solve static type uh, pretty soon. Uh, they are not open source the ID their ID support yet, but they are planning. So that we are expecting to see it pretty soon. Uh, we don't since we don't have type annotation in inline in your programs, so that type information in separated file, so that it's kind of hard to maintain. Then maybe we can add the ID editor support. For example, the uh, completion, like uh, other programming language, and uh, we might have the pop-up type definition as a documentation, and then we may have the pop-up type annotation or annotation uh, type annotation editing, so that so that you don't have to worry about uh, the separated file. So you may have a question here: Why static types? Because 
we need better check, uh, we better type check for to boost productivity, and uh, the static type could be uh, better documentation for your programs, and uh, the stat ty static type information can provide the help better to support. Uh, but uh, some may ask, why no annotation? Why don't you add that type annotation to the language, so that so that you don't have to worry about the, you know, the separated type information file or anything like that. There are several reasons. As I said, it's not dry. And the second one is it changes the language we love. So that add type annotation to the language so that everyone forces you uh, to write static types to the language, but it loses some kind of the flex flexibility of the language, and then you have to write more. The, our Ruby programs love, uh, runs not without any problem, without type annotation right now. So the, that means adding type annotation is kind of redundant. So the, I hate that. Uh, the third reason is the performance don't need type annotations. Some may uh, think, okay, adding type annotation or type hint, uh, type declaration may make language uh, compiler faster, but it's not. Uh, for example, uh, V8 virtual machine for JavaScript on Chrome browser uh, runs JavaScript, which is a dynamic type programming language, and it runs brilliantly really fast. And, uh, and a friend of mine back in Japan wrote uh, experimental ahead of time compiler for Ruby, which runs the 50 times faster than C Ruby for small uh, micro benchmarks. It's not for Ruby, but uh, uh, Ruby has a potential to run 50 times faster in some cases. That means those two compilers don't use any type information from the programs. So the, that is the evidence. We don't need type declaration for performance. Uh, the other question is the why separated type information files? Uh, that the reason is we cannot tell the future, so the, but we can just guess it. And uh, in the history of the programming language, static type programming language camp and the dynamic programming language camp has the you know the uh, the back and go and back and forth. Okay, the first programming language named Fortran is a static type programming language, and the second generation of the Lisp programming, uh, Lisp programming language is a dynamic type programming language, and uh, in, they are influenced each other, so that uh, at one time, the dynamic type programming language it was strong, uh, for example, 90s and the early 2000s, the dynamic type programming language, including Ruby, is pretty strong, but uh, in 2010s, so the static type programming language are, are stronger uh, because of the better type checking. But uh, at the same time, the newer language influenced by the dynamic type programming language, so that they add a type inference, they don't uh, somewhat skip type declaration. So I guess, I predict the future so that the, our program uh, is, uh, we can write our program without any type inf declaration, but it is as, uh, as strict as the static type programming language, as we can find as much error as the static type programming language. If that would come true, so the type declaration will be some kind of obsolete things. But uh, once we add anything to the language, it's quite difficult to remove that. So that that's the reason I said compromise. The separated uh, type information files is kind of a compromise. We are trying to make our compiler smarter and smarter. And uh, we, we try to create the future so that we, we don't need type information 
provided from the, uh, the provided in the, the separated files uh, at all. So the smart compilers can guess and predict the errors you create in your software. So the I the, this compromise is made to avoid possible future limitation to the language. So that what will happen with these, these components? Uh, your ordinary programs will be statically type-checked without any type, type annotations in your Ruby programs. If you, you, if you refine type definition files, you, have, you will have better checking. So won't that be cool? We're working on it, and the result is promising, at least from my point of view. <laughs> okay, this is static typing. Okay, performance. Uh, no language can be fast enough. Everyone complains. <laughs> uh, as I said before, Ruby 2 improved the performance like this, but uh, even further in Ruby 3. We need more performance. Uh, we have bigger service, and uh, we people have anxiety of choosing Ruby because of the performance. But, uh, we need to address bottlenecks. And then we have many, many bottlenecks in our applications. Memory, CPU, and I.O., for, for to name few. The memory is the first bottleneck. Uh, that's why we have been working on garbage collector improvement for years. The Ruby, Ruby 2.1 introduced the generation garbage collector, and the Ruby 2.2 introduced the incremental garbage collector. Uh, Ruby 2.6 introduced the transient heap. And uh, Ruby 2.7, which will be released in co coming December, will have the object compaction. Uh, by those improvements, we have the better memory management. And, uh, we are trying to even further. So the, but that in some cases, we still have the CPU bottleneck. So the, to address this kind of CPU bottleneck, we are working on JET compiler, just in time compiler, which generates the uh, native code in our, in our memory so that we can run our methods in, nat in native code. It is kind of my dream. But uh, the uh, Ruby contributor named Vladimir Makalov, who is living in Canada, <laughs> who works for Red Hat, actually, uh, he's Russian. And, uh, He's, he's smart. His day job is working on the GCC in Red Hat. He, in his day job, he improved the performance of the GCC compiler. And in his hobby time, he implemented the JIT compiler for Ruby. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> and uh, his, his prototype worked pretty well for the micro benchmarks. And uh, it works the, uh, four times faster for our micro benchmarks, but it doesn't work for the bigger Ruby applications. So the uh, Takashi Kokubun uh, came in, and uh, he re-implemented the, uh, the MJIT JIT compiler and uh, introduced it into Ruby 2.6. And he's here somewhere. <laughs> And he will, he will gonna uh, explain about his work and uh, his uh, improvement over the JIT compiler. Last. Okay, for in CPU intensive tasks, we have the benchmarks named Optocarrot, which is the Nintendo Entertainment System emulator, so which runs the, the NES games. And uh, Ruby 2.6 with JIT runs 2.8 times faster than Ruby 2.0. That's not bad. Three times faster, almost three times faster. And then Ruby 2.7, with improvement by Takashi, which runs even faster. But uh, for Rails app, you, you have interested in the 
four months of rails up, right? Uh, for rails up, JIT compiler runs slower. Uh, we have re reasons. We have the most of the Rails application, memory is the bottleneck, and the JIT compiler is trying to uh, resolve the CPU bottleneck. And then uh, at the price, at the cost of memory. So the memory bottlenecks even getting worse. <laughs> and then uh, Rails is a big, big, big framework, and we have many hot methods. Uh, so we have to compile many methods, and the compiling at the runtime has its own cost. The, the, the third thing is the, uh, next to the memory bottlenecks in Rails application, the I.O. bottlenecks comes next, not the CPU bottlenecks. Improving the CPU uh, weighs little. Uh, so go to Takashi's talk. Uh, by his effort, in Ruby 2.7, we'll run Rails application with JIT, runs as fast as without it. <laughs> Not bad. Anyway, uh, Vladimir Makarov, who is also working on the, the, another the JIT implementation, which is called MIL, uh, so, which is lightweight JIT. So the, I, I don't think me, me, uh, Mills is, was included in the Ruby 3.0, but uh, in the future, we would, ha we would have the three-tire jet. So the, the most of the code runs in the VM, inter uh, but uh, some hot methods are compiled by the mill, which has 80% uh, of the performance of MJet, with the cost the less than one-tenth of the, the cost. And a very hard method can be compiled by the memjet. So that we, with those three tire uh, JIT architecture, we can run the, the CPU intensive task much, much faster. Uh, JIT may not be used for web application because the first bottleneck of the web application is memory. The second bottleneck of the web application is the, is the I/O. So the uh, the web application usually are not CPU intensive tasks. But uh, JIT would be useful for research computing. The so maybe. Right now, people use Python for, or Julia or Earl to, for the AI and the machine learning and the research computing. But uh, uh, with, in the future, so that some of them may choose Ruby for its performance with JIT compiler. So the other way to improve performance is concurrency. So we have the multi-core age. We are in the multi-core age, but the concurrency is hard. Uh, actually, I regret adding threads. Remember, when I created threads in the Ruby, we have only one computer, uh, one CPU at the per computer. So that, uh, but uh, in multi-core ages, the threads are hard to use correctly, hard to use efficiently, and uh, most importantly, it's, they're pretty hard to debug. So we need better abstraction. So the, we're working on something named guilds and old fibers. Maybe we would change the name in the future uh, because uh, guilds, uh, the guild class is used by the, some uh, software in the gaming industry. <laughs> yeah. Actually, the code name guild for the C, uh, is for concurrency for CPU bottleneck. And odd fiber is the I/O bottleneck. They are easy to use and easy to debug and easy to perform. Uh, the language like Go and Elixir has the single entity for concurrency. Go, go routine for goals and then the processes for Elixir. But uh, remember, those language are the are concurrency concurrent programming language from its day one. But uh, Ruby is not. So that we have to make some kind of a compromise. That 
to have the two entities, one for I/O intensive tasks, the other for the CPU intensive task. Uh, but uh, we need better names. Uh, maybe we rename the guilds to isolate because the guilds, those, those things are isolated each other. And then uh, we, we may, might use just fiber instead of out fiber. Uh, your opinion is all welcome, so that feel free to propose new name for the concept. Uh, those improvements, including concurrency, are inspired by functional programming languages, uh, static typing, concurrency map models, and uh, we are a little bit further to moving toward the functional programming. For example, we are going to introduce a number of block parameters uh, from Scala and Clojure, which, which are the functional programming language. Uh, this is the one. Oh, okay. You can skip the, the block parameters, in, use the, the underscore one instead of the bar A things. Yeah, it's kind of simpler. And the pattern matching. Uh, not a regular ex expression pattern matching, but a functional programming pattern matching. Uh, it's like this. Uh, read JSON and symbolize names. And then uh, we want to find an uh, entity whose name is Alice and uh, whose children is Bob and then retrieve the age of his, uh, her son, print age. But if you, find, if you can't find Alice in the JSON file, you just print no Alice. Simple. Uh, without pattern matching, you have to write like this, retrieve person whose name is Alice, then take our children, the children, we have one, have one children, and the first, one, first children's name is Bob, the print H. They compare those two, yeah, the former with the pattern matching is much straightforward. Uh, chaining, pipeline operator. Uh, pipeline operator is used by the language like F sharp and Elixir, and then we are trying to introduce it, uh, like this instead of this. But uh, I gave up the idea. <laughs> uh, let me explain a little bit about that. Uh, pipeline operator in F sharp, uh, the definition is uh, pipeline operator is like this. And then it works as the, as the primary argument at the end of its argument list. And the pipeline operator in Elixir def it's de uh, is defined by macro and the other primary argument as the first argument of the method call. Because of the, uh, in ML, um, ML language, the primary argument uh, comes last at the, the functions, function arguments. And uh, in Elixir culture, the primary method, most important method, for example, uh, the target of the map function, it comes first of the, the function argument. So the, the, this difference, last and first, comes from the difference of the language culture. So the, the concept of the pipeline operator is the other primary argument to the call. So the, if we would provide the pipeline operator in Ruby, uh, the primary argument to the call means uh, the primary argument as the receiver. Because of the map method of Ruby, the, the target array or target sequence comes as the receiver of the language. Uh, but I find that people don't uh, share the concept. You know, adding argument, the first uh, the function argument, not the receiver that they, they wanted, and they complained about that. Uh, you know that the people find Ruby usable, and then people find Ruby comfortable 
because we share common sense, some, some kind of common sense. But uh, it find out the, in the very specific to the, the pipeline operator, the we, me, and the community don't share the common sense. So I, I instead of trying to prostrate the community, I just give up. <laughs> It's not that it's before 2.7 final release, and uh, I had to experiment to find out. Yeah. At, the <clears throat> at least we get some ideas. For example, uh, we find out we couldn't put the comments in the method chains like this. Uh, prior to Ruby 2.6, adding the comments that break the chain. So the Ruby 2.7 will allow this kind of the comment in the method chain. And then the other thing is the right assignment, uh, which is like this. Uh, 1, 200, map, soul, reverse, take 5. Then if you want to assign that re result to the, vari to the variable, you have to go back to the top to, of the chain, then add the assignment, A equal to something like that. But uh, it's, uh, it's against the, our natural eyeball movement. Goes, goes first to top to bottom, the left to right. So the, if we could add the right assignment, the, okay, we have the seek range from 1 to 100, map, sort, reverse, take 5, then assign to the top 5 variable things. Uh, this is just a concept, but uh, at least the, this kind of pipeline operator discussion inspires me, this, this concept. Okay. I'm not sure it will be in the Ruby 3 or not, but uh, at least we have the idea. Uh, in addition, we have some uh, crazy ideas, right assignment I told you, and uh, implicit receiver in blocks. Uh, so, uh, suppose we have this, this kind of the, the code snippet. So we, we do write like this, uh, the symbol as a block, block argument. But uh, if we want to add the, the argument to the method, you cannot write like this because the, uh, the block argument takes a symbol, but not the argument. <laughs> uh, some people propose <laughs> like this. The, this is a default receiver. Hmm. <laughs> or, yeah. The, <laughs> what do you think? Nah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no? Yeah, this is just idea. I have a bunch of these kind of crazy ideas, and uh, only a few survives and emerge into the language. Yeah, this is kind of the food for thought. Anyway, we need to survive to provide benefit to our users. Ruby need to be survived to sustain our lives. I'm a full-time Ruby worker, so that if Ruby disappears, my life will be ruined. And uh, we will keep moving forward. But not, we does not mean only a core committers, the Ruby designer, but with you. So we as a community, Ruby community as a whole, uh, try to keep moving forward to make you and us happy and to make the better world a better place. Uh, this is the whole purpose of the Ruby language and the Ruby community. Ah, uh, placebo. <laughs> Друзья, давайте two questions from the hall and other questions in uh, outside, okay? 
Hi, Matt. Uh, yes. Thank you for Ruby in general. And my question is, do you have any plans to help uh, machine learning and mathematical tasks in the future in Ruby, except mm -hmm. of JIT compiling? Yeah. Uh, actually, the, we are helping two, two projects. One is the SciRuby, which is the re-implementation of the SciPy. And then the, uh, the other is the Red Data tool, which uh, with coordinate, coordinate with uh, uh, the SciRuby. Uh, Red Data tools implement the, uh, the PyCall, which can call the Python library from Ruby in Ruby syntax. And then the other is Apache Arrow, which is the, uh, the data format and the memory format and library to share the machine learning data matrix between the, the languages. The third one is the uh, Red Chainer, which is the machine learning library implemented in Ruby. And then those, uh, uh, those pro attempt will improve the situation of the machine learning and the, and the AI things in Ruby. And uh, we, we really hope that that would Im improve the uh, productivity of the uh, who loves uh, machine AI and the Ruby and that together. Thank you. And one more question. Oh, yes. Hey, thank you, Mats, for Ruby in general. Where like, are you? Yeah. Oh, there. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a simple question. When you say that the Ruby is moving forward and you're working hard on that and like you, you're in the community in general, so my question is, do you expect from the Ruby developer, from the general Ruby developer, to help with the uh, Ruby internals? I mean, to write some C code, mm -hmm. to provide some PRs or whatever, or like, you are not. I mean. uh, we are more than welcome if you are interested in the core and if you want to work with us, so that we welcome you. you. And, uh, but uh, the most of the Ruby internals are written in C and uh, some C++ and some assembly. And uh, so that it's, you know, the obstacle is, the, the entering hurdle is a little bit high. But uh, if you can uh, obtain that hurdle, so that we are more than welcome you. And uh, in addition, so that discussion about the new features like, like language design, like a pipe programming operator or some kind of the, the div, uh, implicit receiver things, and uh, that kind of stupid idea, is we discussed on the, uh, our uh, issue tracker, Redmine. So that, uh, that, you know, joining to the discussion itself is pretty much valuable. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.